One of the most surprising movies I've seen recently was 2022's Prey. I've always been more of a fan of the Alien franchise than the Predator one, but after several decades of dumb sequels, endless merchandise, and spin-off media, the expectations I have for both franchises are at an all-time low. Both the original Alien and Predator movies are thoughtful, intense, and memorable. Their sequels and spin-offs, however, all seem to be 20th Century Fox and now Disney trying to catch lightning in a bottle over and over to varying degrees of success. There's variations to the formulas over time, but Alien is always going to be about some gritty short-haired brunette fighting a sex bug, while Predator is always about some sort of gritty survivor whose story arc is interrupted by a big game hunter with dreads. I don't think telling the same story over and over is necessarily a bad thing. We've been doing that since the dawn of time. All cultures have a creation myth. Most religions have an end-of-the-world scenario. All cultures have an explanation for storms and fire and everything else in the world around us. People tell stories about things that are important to them. There are so many different flood myths besides Noah's Ark in the Mesopotamian and Mediterranean areas probably because a massive flood actually did happen, and all these separate cultures individually try to make sense of such a horrible experience. The original Alien and Predator movies were a big deal in the world of sci-fi pop culture, so I'm not surprised that writers and filmmakers and studios have constantly tried to retell the same stories over and over again in both franchises. The originals are great movies that have certainly captured my imagination, but I can't help but feel that there's this misplaced reverence and honor that's given to them every time we get a new follow-up movie. This has resulted in two parallel series of endless soft reboots that alternate between 1. Going back to the spirit of the originals to treat them with respect while giving fans confidence that this time will be better than the last, or 2. Shaking up the formula and adding to the alien or predator universes with a bigger story and world building lore that connects all the movies back to the original installment. This pattern of respect and paying homage to the originals leads to the series' biggest problem. All of these movies are essentially the same plots being repeated with extremely similar titles, leading to the Alien and Predator series being some of the hardest movies to talk about in casual conversation. Have you ever seen an Alien or Predator movie? <laughs> I've seen the original Alien, but that's it. I think I saw Alien a long time ago with Sigourney Weaver. Sigourney Weaver? Being a badass? Um, I'm just picturing like that big oval shaped head and the teeth that are like, ah, like a lot of teeth, but you know, and then some like, like demon, like weird creature like pops out of someone's stomach and all that. Not my thing. There's a cat in it, so I like that too. I'm also remembering an alien that had like dreads. Is that one? Those? Okay, yeah, I remember that. And when you say Predator, name a movie, I don't know what, what John you're talking about. I think I've actually seen Predator as well, but I've... Let me think for a minute. Uh, I've been like, just killing humans. Aliens killing humans. 80s, right? It's 80s? 90s? Early 90s? Late 80s? I don't know. It's an incredible movie. Some of the great actors of all time. It's got, oh my god, it's got. It was like jungly, <laughs> I think. Uh, campy. It was. I remember being scared, but also excited. <laughs> like, I kind of was on the alien side, I remember. And I have not seen Alien vs. Predator, but I know that it exists. Do you remember anything else in the plot or anything? You keep talking about Alien. I told you I don't like the movie. I don't like the series. You're kind of, you're a little consumed in that, Daniel. <laughs> like, you're talking about something that doesn't interest me. I've told you a million times. I don't care about it. I'm not interested. So, I don't know. Can we move forward? No. Like a flood myth, the concept of aliens and predators has become part of our cultural memory. And like a flood myth, some versions of these stories have made more of an impression on us than others. I cannot state enough how much I was surprised by Prey. Even though it was the same simple premise as the first one, it kept me engaged with new things to look at, and it was better than the last one I saw. That's already enough to make it a success story in my book, but Prey also has exciting characters with motivations and relationships that feel genuine. 
There's also a cool dog, a title that isn't confusing to talk about, and most importantly, the Predator feels intimidating again. Compare that to 1990's Predator 2, which is also basically the same movie as the original with a different protagonist and a different environment. It's almost the exact same formula that Prey follows, but it just feels so lame in comparison. I know opinions about the sequel have softened over time, and I don't exactly hate it. In long-running movie series, number twos always have a habit of being the weird ones. Following up any successful movie forces the writer to constantly juggle between two really challenging tasks. Writing the best story they possibly can, and analyzing the original entry with the intent of catching lightning in a bottle again. With this in mind, the original Predator feels like a challenging movie to write a sequel to. The creature is an unknown presence for most of the movie. Arnold and the audience both have to learn what the Predator is as it stalks them. The main character is basically in an action movie of his own that suddenly gets interrupted and becomes a mystery. Honestly, how do you write a sequel to a mystery the audience already knows the answer to, and still capture the same intensity? So all things considered, Predator 2 isn't the worst case of sophomore slump I've ever seen. I like a lot of the twist 2 does to separate itself from the original. The first one was a sweaty movie with a lot of guns, so LA in the middle of a heatwave feels like a natural transition from one setting to another. I really appreciate Danny Clover as Detective Harrigan. He's a cop who's just too old for this shit, an urban 90s parallel to the scrappy survivor Arnold played in the original. Predator 2 actually has a whole lot going for it, but its worst parts are its attempts to recreate the Arnold movie. You are one ugly mother. <laughs> sure, poorly aged CG and weird lore don't help, but I can forgive things like old special effects and corny world building. If you pay too much attention to the canon of Predator, you end up getting distracted by the Predator being a really weird and pathetic movie monster. It struggles with getting wet, it wants to drain the autism from children, and it steals frozen meat at night. Somewhere in between the scenes shot for Predator 2 is a subplot of post-motorcycle accident Gary Busey setting up hidden cameras in a meat locker so he can catch an alien sneaking a midnight beef treat. He comes here every two days to feed. Seems he has a taste for beef. My point is that sequels and expanded universes will always inevitably lead to silly details becoming canon to a series. It's unavoidable, so that's not what I'm talking about when I say The Predator in 2 is really lame. It ultimately boils down to two concepts that are incredibly well done in the original Predator and Prey, but forgotten about in 2. Scale and depth. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that I've always preferred the Xenomorph from Alien over the Predator, and even though I do genuinely love Alien and Aliens as an adult, I'm sure most of my bias comes from a childhood full of tie-in merchandise. I grew up in this very specific window in the early 90s, when R-rated franchises were being marketed towards children. My poor mom didn't have the greatest grasp on English, and I imagine a lot of out-of-touch parents like her probably had a hard time shopping for their kids. For my mom, the process of picking out toys for me probably involved a lot of grabbing random green monsters, because I like Ninja Turtles. This ended up with me being surrounded by a lot of Alien vs Predator merchandise as a kid, even though I wasn't allowed to watch the Alien or Predator movies. So through the perspective of a child being bombarded by commercials, action figures, comics, and video games, Xenomorphs were always so exciting to look at. They could change their appearance depending on what kind of toy or boss monster was needed. This mostly resulted in spin-off material just featuring bigger and spikier and greener versions of the original Aliens. But I won't deny that this made an impression on me in the first grade. The Xenomorphs are unlike anything we've ever seen on Earth before, so we have an easy time believing that there are unseen forms of the species like a huge queen or a gorilla variant. You can't really do the same with the Predator design because the creature is too close to real human beings, and really, it's just always going to be just a really tall guy in a suit. When it breaks away from that formula, it just looks… awkward. Simply making a Predator physically larger just doesn't make it scarier. The Predator is only threatening when the audience understands it is dangerous and large in relation to the main character. Let's call this… The Predator Illusion. A man in a costume is just a man in a costume, unless they look like they could ruin your day. 
Prey gives us a very energetic way of establishing how much of a threat the Predator is to the main character, Naru. In three quick sequences, we see the Predator take down three different animals that we instinctively know could ruin her day. A snake, a wolf, and a bear. The bear kill is especially effective because not only do we see that the Predator is as tall as a bear, it is also strong enough to carry the entire bear over its head. My favorite detail of the sequence is that we see all this from Naru's perspective as she is on the ground looking up. She's in a position of extreme vulnerability, and we, the audience, instantly understand that the Predator is a threat to her. The Predator might really just be a tall man, but it's one that is currently looming over the camera. Compare that shot to a similar scene in the Danny Glover movie where we also see a low angle shot looking up at the Predator as it stands triumphantly. Instead of a bear or a human being used as a size reference, we get the top part of LA's Art Deco Eastern building. Even though we're still looking up at the Predator, it looks tiny and insignificant in front of a tower. If the Predator feels like a tall man in a monster suit right now, then this movie's cinematography has done a poor job demonstrating scale to you. Scale is vital towards visually explaining to an audience what's at stake for the main characters. Giving the audience perspective in a movie is central towards setting up the story's conflict and establishing what the power dynamics surrounding the characters are. The duel between Dutch and the Predator in the original movie is a terrific example of using scale to convey power. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a huge man and isn't that much shorter than the actor portraying the Predator. One of the few shots where we see them both standing together depicts them as equals facing off. But once the creature gets the upper hand in this duel, we frequently see shots of Arnold on the ground crawling away. Every time we see this action from Arnold's perspective, the camera is a low angle shot looking up at the Predator. The Predator is physically threatening because it is always shown as looming over us. We're constantly forced to look upwards at the monster, and even then it's so massive that we can't even see the entire Predator in one frame. Compare this to shots of Arnold trying to escape. He looks tiny and vulnerable because the camera is constantly looking down on him with a high angle shot. These alternating shots end up forming a sequence where we are told without a word that in this power dynamic, the Predator has the upper hand and Arnold is the underdog. Notice how the use of camera angles shifts when the fight ends up in Arnold's favor. This entire time we have looked upwards at the Predator, but once it's defeated we look even more upwards once we realize it has fallen to a trap that's even bigger than a tall man in a monster suit. This is the effective version of that eastern building shot in Predator 2. The way the Predator is shot here gives me no indication how much of a threat it's supposed to be. This low angle perspective belongs more in a movie about some goofy character being overwhelmed by the big city. What really baffles me is that I think 20th Century Fox is proud of the shot. My earliest memories of the Predator were from these posters for this movie, and the eastern building shows up in an earlier shot where the Predator looks like Batman. I get the gist that the film crew had permission to shoot at the Eastern Building and wanted to include as much iconic Los Angeles imagery as much as possible, in order to promote that the Predator was now in a different jungle. Again, I think LA is a fine choice for a setting, but the filmmakers just never effectively used the city to make the Predator a threat to Detective Harrigan. The creature is frequently shot with the same neutral perspective as all the other characters in this movie, and I end up not knowing how big anything is. For instance, I hate how confusing this whole headache-inducing train sequence is. At this point in the movie, I have no idea why the Predator is still invisible as it's plowing through all these extras that belong more in a Robocop movie. It looks terrible and feels like a missed opportunity for what could have been a cool urban action scene. The only part I care for in this whole train sequence is when the Predator scans Detective Cantrell and realizes she's pregnant. And even here, size is an issue because the detective looks about as tall as these trains but is suddenly being picked up by the Predator in the flattest shot ever. This happens after we've already seen it stumble around inside the train looking like an invisible ghost of some guy. There's no sense of perspective in this sequence, even when the Predator is holding Detective Contrell by the throat. This is one of the only scenes I can think of where a character has to look up at the Predator because of how large it is, and yet we never see it from her point of view. The only other scene I can think of in which a character looks up at the Predator is this terrible graveyard scene, which brings me to my next point. <laughs> I've always found this graveyard scene to be embarrassing. I previously mentioned that this movie fails when it tries too hard to be like the original Predator, and everything that happens here is a perfect encapsulation of that pattern. Remember when the Predator studied everyone with thermal vision and recorded their voices? <laughs> well, here it is again, but 
not scary. Want some candy? Want some candy? Want some candy? Remember when the last predator was a hunter in the Amazon rainforest? Well, here's this predator standing in front of some foliage. Remember when Arnold realized he was being stalked? Here's Danny Glover coming to the same realization. Actually, it's this overly dramatic scene that reminds me of the second reason why I find the Predator so lame. In addition to not knowing how big anyone is in this movie, I really struggle with understanding where any of the characters are in relation to each other. I'm not talking about the Predator hiding with his invisibility cloak on. I get that it's supposed to be hidden from the main characters. We, the audience, just don't know where it's being invisible. In the first Predator, we see the creature stalking Arnold and his team from the trees. We don't always know where exactly in the trees it is, but we know it's there. When the Commando characters are hiding from the Predator, we understand that they are hiding in the jungle from something also hiding in the jungle. During these close-up shots, note how the Commandos are always shown clearly while there's some out-of-focus foliage in front and behind them. There's not much else to these shots, but we get a sense that this jungle is thick and our characters should be hidden. Our characters in the original Predator are essentially being shot with the portrait mode from your phone camera. If you've ever used that function before, then you're already familiar with what depth of field does. I don't want to dive too deep into the math of f-stops and lenses in today's episode, but in short, this portrait photography style of focusing creates a narrow depth of field. That is, we don't see much else in front of or behind the subject that's in focus. We end up with a layered claustrophobic shot that creates a tension as thick as the jungle our characters are hiding in. Compare the jungle shots to the cemetery scenes with Danny Glover. Cemeteries are wide open spaces and there's nowhere for a really tall man to hide. Again, yes, we understand the predator is invisible, but we don't get any real indicators that it's even in the same cemetery as Glover. This narrow depth of field focus on Harrigan gives us no context on anything, and these repeated shots of a sweaty Danny Glover having a panic attack belong more in a mental health or elderly care PSA. We have the exact opposite problem in other parts of the movie where there is a wide depth of field. This penthouse scene bugs me so much because everything is in focus. Combined with the camera depicting the predator in the most boring, flattest angle ever, the creature just comes off as a magic ghost who can appear and disappear wherever it wants. I imagine the director and the cinematographer had a hard time figuring out how to make an invisible jungle hunter intimidating in an environment with more wide open spaces. It's not impossible. I actually really liked how other movies have depicted the creature in open areas. Even in this wide open field and prey, we see layers in the foreground and background. Depth makes things interesting to look at. This flat stucco wall with a ghost of a tall man in front of it is not very interesting to look at. The one scene in the second movie that works for me is the slaughterhouse. Yes, seeing a post-motorcycle accident Gary Busey finally becoming unhinged is a huge part of why I enjoy the sequence. Get out of here, Arrogant. I want to save your ass. It's between me and him. But more importantly, the dangling rows of beef treats gives us a clear idea of how the Predator could hide and hunt down Gary Busey's team of Ghostbusters. It probably really helps that the monster loses its invisibility in the scene, giving the crew a tangible actor to film and direct for once. It's still as corny and aged as the rest of the movie, but this is probably the only sequence in the whole thing where we get a grasp on what the Predator's strengths and limitations are. We finally understand that this is a hunter and a stalker, not just a teleporting boogeyman. All good movie villains need rules, especially with horror monsters. They're like urban legends, or maybe even a flood myth, in the sense that they act as cautionary tales. Just as floods were sent by gods to punish sinners, the shark in Jaws can't hurt you if you don't get in the water, and the sex pest in it follows won't touch you if you don't have sex. Even Howie Mandel in Little Monsters has a set of rules to follow as he seduces minors while hiding under their beds. This is more than I can say for the creature in Predator 2. Sure, the Predator probably isn't the scariest movie monster out there, but it can be an effective villain. By letting the audience know that a Predator can be defeated, it is a much more believable threat to the main characters. In Predator 2, the creature is all-powerful until it isn't. I think this technically makes Danny Glover the most powerful protagonist in all these movies, which is fine. It just feels unearned because the camera work never really lets us know what this creature really is. And as a result, we never really know what the main character can do. Because this is a new dance, and it's called 
Predator. I really don't hate Predator 2. I find it really cheesy and dated, but ultimately it does come off as a missed opportunity to me. I've seen fans defend this movie because of what it adds to the Alien and Predator universes, but lore and world building alone don't make a movie good for me. Good filmmaking and good storytelling do. Maybe we'll see the Predator in an urban jungle environment again one day, and maybe whoever does it will take note of what made Prey work. I'm honestly pretty hopeful about this for both the Alien and Predator franchises. Disney now owns both series, and who else is better at remaking the same things over and over but new packages? I'm looking forward to seeing what's in store for these properties, as long as future filmmakers remember to visually show us how much of a threat their villains are. Without scale, we don't know how big a monster is. Without depth, we don't know where the monster is. Fail to meet these two simple criteria, and no Predator illusion is created. Instead, the audience will just end up watching a ghost of a really tall man that steals meat, covets autism, and is secretly being recorded by Gary Busey. I guess you're wondering what we're doing here in these barbecue outfits. Well, it's easy. We're going in after another world life force from another galaxy that has a self-defense mechanism that we don't understand. It's intangible to this time and space. It's actually from the theory of relativity and from the theory of quantum mechanics. Take those properties and equalize them, and you have the quantum theory of gravity, which is a discussion of how this universe started and how it will end. The Predator knows that information already. 